My name is Joe Orefice. I am a Director of Forest and Agricultural Operations at the Forest School at the Yale School of the Environment. I'm here today at Sessions Woods Wildlife Management Area on a sugar bush that is uh, leased by Rob Lamoth of Lamoth's Sugar House in Burlington, Connecticut. Uh, these, this system, uh, Rob's been tapping it for quite a while. He's had uh, tubing systems up and he was very generous to let us come out today and film. So thanks, thanks to Lamoth Sugar House for all their support. This series is supported by the USDA ACER Access Program. Uh, so we're very, very glad for the generous support of that, that grant um, to offer these videos and follow up workshops. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we're not able to have in-person workshops in 2020, but we hope that uh, either 2021, as soon as we can, we can start doing in-person workshops. For now, what we're doing is offering a video session for folks, and then we'll have a follow-up um, time when people can chat with us via Zoom and uh, talk, ask questions one-on-one, -on -one, think about their, their individual situations. This video today is intended for producers who have not yet installed tubing systems or are new to tubing systems um, and want to learn some of the components. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through different components of the system both at the tree all the way down to main lines and um, how all those components work and go together and how someone may install that system so they can be more efficient in their maple production and possibly expand their production. This video today uh, is going to walk you through a 5 16 tubing system. We're going to have a, another part of the series that covers 3 16 tubing, um, but 5 16 is, is where we're going to focus our efforts today. Uh, one thing if you're thinking about putting a tubing system and, and maintaining a tubing system is the time of year when you're going to do it. Um, try not to wait till maple season to start installing your tubing system. Not only is it going to take a while to install, you're going to have to figure out all your connections to tanks, you're going to have to set up your tanks, you're going to have to level the whole situation. Uh, if you have vacuum, that whole system. So if you're going to do a tubing system, keep in mind you, you want to start early and before the maple season. Here we're going to look at some of the basic components of a tubing system for maple sap collection. Um, a couple of basic things. The tubing is a plastic tubing. There's different kinds of it. And uh, you, can, you can talk to, to maple equipment dealers about which ones may be more appropriate for your needs. In general, uh, the common size tubing is a 5 16th diameter tubing, which is what we have here. There is a 3 16th diameter tubing option, but we're going to cover 3 16th tubing in another series. Um, and this tubing is used to bring sap from the tree down to a collection tank or directly to the sugar house. Um, it's very efficient, it saves a lot of time over buckets, and you can, um, you can also reuse it year to year. So much of this tubing will last 10 years or more uh, if you take care of it. So basic components of the system, one is a spout, and these typically get replaced every year with a new clean spout. Some people will utilize spouts year after year, but we'll talk about that in another video on um, tapping trees and spout selection. But you have your spout, your spout goes into your tree in the springtime. Sap flows down what's called your drop line. So the drop line goes from the spout to what's called your lateral line. So when you're using this 5 16 flexible tubing, you have a spout, a drop line going to your lateral line. The fitting that you're going to use to connect your drop line to your lateral line is a T fitting. And in this case, because this, this spout is along a line that continues to go to another tree, our T needs to be open on three sides. So that T is open here, open here, and open here. Sap from this tree can flow down into the line and then flow down towards your collection system. Sap from previous trees will flow through that T and continue to go on. One of the big things to think about when you're putting in a tubing system is your drop line length. Because if you replace your spouts every year, you're going to clip this. You're not going to pull the spout off. You're going to cut this so you have a clean, fresh end of your drop line, and you're going to press a new spout in at the beginning of the season. So you want to make sure that if you're going to keep this for 10 years, you need to have enough length that you can continue to reach around the tree. Because you can't tap in the same spot, as, as many of you I'm sure know. And so you need to be able to access different points of the tree meaning your drop line needs to be long enough. 
Some people will, will replace their drop line every year and they'll clip it down, down lower and put a new drop line on to try to um, keep their tap holes more sanitary and not get tap hole closure as quickly. But that's a more complex uh, dynamic when you're thinking about do I replace my drop lines or just my spout or do I not replace everything every year. And that depends on the level of production you're looking for and a level of efficiency. Um, and also as it relates to cost of the whole system. So there's always a question of how many trees do you, do you include in each lateral line. Um, and there's different ways of thinking about this. 316 has its own uh, set of rules and, and we'll talk about that in a 316 diameter lateral video. But this is 516 tubing, it's most common. Um, with 516 tubing, if you're under vacuum, oftentimes people will recommend like three to five taps per lateral line. Um, meaning each, each lateral has three to five taps that come off of it. Um, that's going to give you the maximum vacuum in your system. Uh, but you can you don't have to stick to that rule. There's, there's really not a lot of loss if you start adding more taps. And you can go up to 10, 12, even 15 taps per lateral line um, with 5 sixteenths tubing and really not see any, production, any loss in production. Um, so that's sort of the ballpark where you're in. You could also just have one. You have one gorgeous tree near your main line. There's nothing around it. It may make sense for you to run your lateral line to connect to a single tree. Um, that's fine as well. So uh, it's always a balance of how much main line do you want versus how much lateral and then how far away the trees are. One thing to keep in mind is if your trees are very spaced apart, you may be running a lot of lateral line to capture a tap and you may not actually get the value back for that. So if you're going to be running lateral lines, you want to make sure your trees um, are somewhere 50 feet apart or less so you can be efficient um, in running your lines. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with running a lateral line way far out to capture a tree you're, you feel good about. Um, but if you start thinking in production, do think about the economics of running long distances to capture one or two taps. Um, it may or may not be worth it depending on your situation. And you, that's where you need to read the woods. But this is what we're looking at with, uh, with lateral lines in number of trees. Here's a tool that's pretty useful when running lateral lines. This is a hanging uh, spool or hanging reel. And it holds your spool of lateral line tubing and it'll spin as you pull it to weave through trees. What you're going to do with this lateral line is you're going to weave through the trees you'd like to tap. And maybe even a tree you, you're not intending to tap just to get more pressure on the line. And that weave is going to hold your lateral line up once you put tension on your final tree. Um, and so this, this tool is going to be is really nice because it just un unrolls that tubing in a very efficient, um, non-bird's nest way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this and you can watch, uh, watch how it works. In this segment, we're going to talk about how you would use your lateral line um, and your end tree to set up your end of your lateral line system. Um, one of the nice things about this flexible tubing is you can be flexible in how you set it up. And so with your end of the line system, what you're going to do is you're going to wrap it around a tree. And I'll talk about the components in a minute, but you're going to wrap it around a tree and you're going to leave enough space in there, one, for that tree to grow, and two, for you to be able to pull on your lateral line and raise it. or sorry, lower it and raise it up. Um, and that's really important because that gives you the ability to keep your pitch on the system. Because even if you're on vacuum, which is which would be putting vacuum pressure and sucking sap out of the trees, you still want to work with gravity. And you still want to have your system flow towards your collection point. So being able to change your pitch of your lateral lines is really important. The other thing this helps with leaving space and, and leaving this flexible is if a tree limb lands on it, it'll move and bend down and you'll have less damage to fix. So a pretty important piece of this is, is leaving enough space in here for your tree to grow and your system to continue on. Some of the components of this, just like um, we, we mentioned in another part of this video, you have your spout, your drop line, and then your lateral line. But in this case we have some special fittings for this end of the line. One of those fittings is a plugged T. So this is a three-way T, 
and one end of this T has a plug in it. I don't know if that can be seen on the video. So that plug is different than the open end. And it's very important that the plugged end goes towards the back of the lateral line. So that way when sap flows down your drop line from your spout, sap flows down into your um, into your fitting, it will flow down and towards your collection system. If you have a plugged T and you put it on backwards, or you put it somewhere in the middle of the line, it's going to prevent sap flow in your whole system. So these are great to have, but make sure you're using the appropriate ones in the right setup. One thing we, we one thing I really like to do, and we will, be, we will be doing at the Yale Forest when we set up our demonstration area, is always using plug tees that are a different color than open tees. So this is an open tee. All of our open tees are black. All of our plug tees will be green or red, and that way we know it's plugged. So very important to make sure when you're using a plug tee, it goes in the right spot. But the nice thing about a plug tee here is that plugged tee prevents sap from having to go around the tree and just a bunch of grime building up in there that'll never flush out. So those plug tees are pretty important for the purpose of um, sending sap in the correct direction. Other components of this end of line system uh, include this, this Y. So the way, way, we're using, way it's being designed here um, is this Y serves to send the lateral line around the tree and back to itself, which creates the simple loop that allows you to raise and lower the tree. That's one method of doing this. The other method is to have your lateral line continue all the way to your T without any Y, continue to your T, come around, you still have your plug T, and then you have an end of line eyelet, which can go into your lateral line and loop through. The key with the eyelet is you need to plan all this because you need to loop it through before you send it around the tree. And that eyelet will cause a camming motion, which will serve the same purpose to create a loop around the tree. A little bit more preferable, in my opinion, than the eyelet are hooks, which the hooks will grab back onto the tubing um, after going around the tree. So another thing you can do is an end of line hook. This one's a double. Um, I don't actually suggest these because this is going to be a double which would then go to a drop line um, and then the sap would have to go all the way around the tree and back out. It saves you from buying a T-fitting. Um, so if you get the concept there that the drop line would go here but then the sap would need to go all the way around the tree assuming this fitting's not here and then go back out which is undesirable. Um, because all that sap's just more travel around the tree. It may actually have to go uphill a little bit before it comes back out. So I, if you're going to use an end of line hook, I'd recommend using an end of line hook that's just a single barb. So it's a, it serves as a plug and a hook. Um, but those are also effective. So anyway, there, there's many ways you can do this and it does depend somewhat on what your preference is. Um, but you, you can decide where you want to go with it. Um, but those are some of the options for your end of lateral line. The biggest thing is make sure you have enough room to move this line up and down. Um, one of the things I, I will add about the eyelets or the hooks compared to the Ys is the eyelet or the, the eyelet or the hook, these allow you to also tension that line further into the future. If I, if I need to tension this line now, I actually need to cut out this Y fitting and shorten everything and put a new one in, which is a lot of work. If I have a eyelet, I'm able to just slide that down the line to tighten up my whole system and that camming action. I can do the same with a hook. So there's some benefit to having these in place for keeping your lateral lines tension into the future. Here I'm going to show you how to do a couple of things. One, how to set up the end of a, of a lateral line and also, most more importantly, how to put on fittings. Um, there's a few different types of tubing, by the way. You may have seen in different parts of this video blue tubing. This is green tubing. Um, I suggest you stick with one or the other, but some folks like to use different tubing for different species, like if they're tapping birch versus maple, they might go from blue for maple and then green to birch, or some producers just like the look of green in the woods versus blue, so they'll stick with green. Um, functionally, there's no, there's no difference, but it's nice for organization. So don't be disturbed if you're seeing a different color tubing. It's all the same stuff. Um, what I'm first going to do on this is I'm just going to show you 
the end of line eyelet. So for the eyelet, I need to remember, um, so I've run my lateral, I have my final tree, in this case it's a red maple, um, I have my, my length. What I need to do now is put on some fittings. And with the eyelet, it's going to go on this end of the line, but I need to remember that it actually needs to go through itself. So before I put it on the end of the line, I need to loop it around itself, around the tree. And now I'm ready to hook that eyelet on itself. And I don't need this all to be incredibly tensioned right now. I just need to know that my length is about the length I want it coming around the tree. So I do want to pull this tight just to make sure this isn't too long. Because I don't want this extending out from the tree more than like three feet or so. Uh, more than three feet you're starting to get pretty extreme. Um, but I also don't want it to be too close to the tree. So if I were to cut this here, that would be too close to this tree. And not only would the tree grow eventually and make it too tight, but I won't have room in here to put my um, end of line T. So I need to make sure I have enough room for my fitting. So where I'm going to put it is, is out from the tree at a moderate distance. Now, if you are strong with your hands, you can press these in. And I can press this fitting and I can, I can wiggle that fitting on there over the first barb. And probably if I went long enough and I bragged about how strong enough I was, maybe I'd prove to you on video I could get it over the second barb. But to be honest, it's going to take me a while to do that and my hands are cold. Um, so the better way of, of putting these fittings on is with what's called a two-handed tool. And your two-handed tool is essentially two vice grips welded to a pretty simple mechanism. Um, these are uh, usually a couple hundred bucks to buy, maybe 150 bucks, depending on what you're getting and where you're getting it from. They make aluminum ones. This is steel. Um, aluminum is night. They're, they're lighter, but you know, steel is probably more common. Uh, and most maple equipment dealers will sell two-handed tools. There's also single-handed tools, which just have a flat um, claw on one side and then one clamp. I'd recommend a two-handed tool because they're more versatile, and you'll you'll see why in a different part of this video on how we why we want two of these but in this case I only need one clamp and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp this just on the opposite side of my fitting so I'm not going to clamp it to where the fitting is getting clamped I'm going to clamp it just past that let me open it up some more okay so I'm going to clamp it just just past that fitting and if it doesn't want to clamp super easy, what you can do is you can loosen up the vice grip and then it's clamped down. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my fitting and I'm just going to press it in there. Okay. And if I get a little sideways like that, what I can do is I can get a little bit closer and I can also straighten out my fitting. Loosen this up, straighten out my fitting. I'm going to just press it in. And you see it just slides right in. It's over both barbs. And I'm good to go. Now, if you want to make that even easier, there's another tool you have on here, which is a flaring tool. And so, they, some of them come with flaring tools, some of them don't. Oftentimes, once you get the hang of these, you don't need the flaring tool. But what the flaring tool will do is it'll put a flare in the end of that tubing. See that flare? And then, then that'll make your fitting slide in a lot easier. So, uh, in straighter. So if you want to use a flaring component, that's an option as well if you have that on your tool. Uh, this one also has a tubing cutter where I can put the tubing across both. And I can cut it. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, that's the basis for a tubing tool and a two-handed tool. And now I have my eyelet, which is on my tubing, and I can adjust this and make it looser, or I can pull my tubing taut. And there's my lateral line. 
I have sap that's able to flow this way down towards my collection and I have my eye hook that I can adjust if I need it in time. One thing to remember is in the winter time your tubing is going to be colder and it's going to shrink up a little bit so it's going to get tighter. So if you're installing tubing in the winter it may loosen up a bit as you get um, later in the maple season when things warm up. If you install your tubing in the summertime you're going to pull, be able to pull it really tight because it's going to be more flexible and then in the winter it's going to get um, even tighter than that as it cools down. So just keep that in mind when you're installing tubing. All right, what we're going to do here is we're going to put together a drop line using the two-handed tool. Um, we're doing it in the field today because that's where we're shooting the video, but one of the nice things about putting together a drop line using a two-handed tool is you can put them together before you go out into the field. Um, in this case, the only T I have is an end-of-line T, so this is going to be an end-of-line drop line. Typically, I make these in the field when I need them because I don't want to ever get them confused with, with the three-way tees that are all open. Um, so a little bit of an exception here, we're making an end-of-line one, but if I'm setting up a tubing system, I'll set up all my drop lines at home by the wood stove or at the table, you know, where I'm comfortable than doing them in the woods. It's going to save time. So, and then I'll, I'll put together only my end-of-lines um, in the woods. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our two-handed tool and I'm going to clamp clamp my tubing I'm going to take my plug T and I'm going to put my tubing on the um, on the vertical portion of that T In this case, I didn't flare it. Again, you could flare it, but we're not going to need to. And I'm going to go over to the second barb. And I hit the end of my line so I can just reconnect. And I can press again. And there's my fitting with the two-handed tool. What I can do next is I can install my spout. And again, some spouts, this one's only got one bar but probably could wiggle that on by hand but this tubing's cold um, my hands are cold I'm just gonna use the two-handed tool and make it really simple so again I will clamp it down and then I will press it until it goes over that barb and again I'm just gonna quickly give it a little bit more space I'm going to press it until it goes over the bar. And there is a completed drop line. That's about two and a half, three feet long, which would be fine for a smaller tree. I, I'd probably want these more like three feet long, um, maybe even four feet, depending on the size of my trees. But um, drop line, ready to go. Now I can take this into the woods. I can bundle a bunch of these together, take them into the woods and go, go with me. What we're going to do here is um, put a uh, drop line onto our lateral tubing. In this case, it's an end of line, and so we will use a plugged T. Um, but if this were uh, in line, we would use an open T. And I always stress that because you wanna make sure you put your plugged T in the right spot facing the right way. In this case, we're gonna put it on this side, and that plugged portion is here, so that way the sap will flow down my drop line, down my lateral, instead of having to go all the way around the tree. Um, to do this, what you first want to do is make sure all your lateral line is tensioned. Because as I tension this, if I, if I install this T here, and then I pull tension, I'm going to end up with that T hitting the tree. And I don't want that. And if I install it way down here, I may not be able to loosen this as much as I need to in the future. So where I want to install the T is somewhat in the middle, maybe a foot, a foot and a half away from the tree. Um, probably about a foot away from the tree is a good way to go. So that way I can still reach around it with my lateral line, with my drop line, um, but I'm not getting in the way of the tree itself, and I'm not getting in the way of my tensioner hook. So I've tightened all my laterals, and it's now time to install this fitting. If you install your fittings before you tighten your lateral line, be it on the end line or along one of your, your trees in line, what's going to happen is you're going to install the fittings for your drop lines you're going to install them where where they sit while the line's loose and then when you tension it they're all going to end up being two or three feet away from the tree 
So always run your lateral lines, tension them, and then go back and install your fittings. That's really important. Um, also, you can't reuse fittings. Um, once you try to cut lateral lines off of them, you get a score in the barbs, which will always be a vacuum leak. So if you're just using a passive gravity system, maybe you can reuse fittings. It's going to take you probably more time than the fitting costs to cut the tubing off, and, and you're going to have scores in it. So it's better to always use a new fitting. Um, and we're good to go here. My line's tensioned. I have my T. I know which direction I want it to go. Um, and I know where I want it to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my two-handed tool. And this is why I like the two-handed tool. Because I have two clamps on it. Okay. Um, and actually I'm going to do this. I'm going to close it when I first clamp it. And now this tool is convenient because it has a cutter. And so I can cut this lateral line with that cutter. And now I have my lateral line broke and ready for the T. In this case, I'll just show you how the flarer works. I can flare both ends. Convenient, makes it easier. I can take my T, again, making sure my plug is in the right direction. I can get it into those. until it goes over both barbs. Once it's over both barbs, it's going to hold the tension, and now I have my drop line ready to go on this tray. My plug is on this side, sap will flow down, go around. This whole part of the lateral line from the plug back to the eye hook will not have any sap in it. It'll always just be, just be free of, of any liquid. I'm going to show you real quick just a, a nice simple tool for working on lateral lines. Um, if you don't have a two-handed tool or you need to get a whole bunch of slack, uh, these are handy. They're really cheap. They're just um, slide tensioners. And the way they work is you got, you got three hooks. This one's set up for 5 16 so there's some that are 5 16 and 3 16 um, What you do is you hook your first hook, your end hook, and then you go to the extent that you have. You hook your middle hook. And then what you can do after you hook your middle hook is pull your third hook and you see I pull the tension out of the line and I can hook my third hook beyond my first hook and now I can work on this lateral hands free of holding any tension. To release this I just pull my last one, let it go, and I'm good to go. So you can work for shortening, shortening lateral lines, installing fittings, whatever you need to do. All right, so um, one of the most important components of your lateral lines is where they connect to your main line. So again, your main line is here. This is a one inch main line. Um, and then we have a 5 16 lateral line. And that's gonna come into um, what's called a manifold or a saddle, but it's a fitting that connects the tubing to the main line. So sap can flow down and then drip in through your, um, to your main line. And if you have vacuum, vacuum pressure can go through the, through the lateral system and pull sap through. A couple of ways of doing this. What we have here is a saddle manifold. Um, this one's got a swivel head, so it can actually turn and move. Uh, those can be nice because it allows you some flexibility on where your line comes in. But there's also a rubber gasket in there where if this gets too much movement over time, you'll get a vacuum leak there. Um, if you're on gravity, it doesn't make as much of a difference. Uh, this saddle has a rubber manifold and a little nipple that goes through the main line. So you drill a hole in the main line, you put your uh, rubber flange on, and then you press your saddle onto it. And in this case, there is a uh, ratcheting system on the bottom but you can use a pair of channel locks and tighten that up. Uh, and then additionally, this sugar maker used two wire ties as a, as a fail safe to keep that sealed with that mainline tubing. Um, one of the bigger, biggest problems that new producers make when they're installing tubing is they will put pressure on their manifold from their lateral line. And so they'll have it where their lateral line is actually pulling, pulling tension on their main line. So lateral directly to the saddle pulling tension. 
that's going to always lead to a vacuum leak and it probably will lead to broken fittings and components too. So what you need is you need some type, some type of hook to hook onto the wire of the main line and hold the tension to the wire instead of to the fitting. Really important. In this case, it's just an inline fitting with a hook. In that system, you can just hook that on and now the tension's here and this loop is not under tension. So this loop's loose and this is under tension. And that allows you to put tension on your lateral line and then connect it to your main line. Um, one of the things I like to do when installing tubing is hook this up first, run my tubing line, hook this up and then tension the end of the line so I'm tensioning against this hook instead of trying to rig all this up later on. But you can do it in that way as well. You can hook, you can run your lateral line, hook up your end, and then go and pull tension here, hook up this, and then remember the last step is always adding all your drop lines um, in your, at, your, at each tap. Another option we have for this, um, instead of this, this inline hook, we could use something called a slide fitting. One of the things I like about slide fittings is one, they're, they're one of the rare reusable plastic fittings. Um, and two, you don't have to cut your lateral line at all. So you don't have this risk of vacuum leaks at each fitting. And so with your um, slide fitting, it goes onto your, I'm actually gonna do it down here uh, for ease. It goes onto your lateral line and then you slide slide it in, doesn't need to go the whole way. Um, and that's gonna create a camming tension again, so a pressure tension. It's got a hook on the bottom, and then that hook can go onto your main line. The nice thing about a slide fitting is I can put this anywhere. So if that wasn't right, I can adjust this. I can take it off. Um, sometimes after it's on, you gotta tap it with a hammer. If I can take it off, I could put it up here. And I could add even more tension to my lateral line. So unlike the fixed fitting, the slide fitting allows me to have a little bit more flexibility in what I'm doing and changes over time. Um, they're more expensive though, and everybody has their preference. Neither option is wrong. It depends on what you're looking for. What's wrong is leaving tension on your manifold. That's wrong. You need to have this loop of loose lateral line so you don't get leaks. All right, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the basics of a mainline system, some of the main components here. Um, so this is a mainline tubing. There's a few different types of mainline tubing you can get. This is black tubing. Um, black tubing has, has pros in that it absorbs heat, and so it'll thaw earlier in the day if you have, if you have frozen lines during the season. Um, but it's also not translucent, so we can't see what's happening in the, inside the tubing. Um, the other problem with black tubing is when you have hot portions of the season, when, you know, late season, it's, the sap's going to get warmer in black tubing than it will in a translucent blue or green tubing. So, um, I'm not one that, that's a big fan of black tubing because I can't see what's going on inside of it. Uh, I, I like translucent blue or translucent green, and in some cases there's translucent black, like smoke-colored tubing. Um, so I, I'd encourage folks to go translucent, but if you have a preference towards black, there's nothing wrong with it. It will work. Um, so that's the main system is tubing, and there's different sizes of tubing. Um, there's some great manuals out there on how to size it. You can talk to producers about what size you need. Uh, this is one inch tubing. The smallest you, you, you will get is three quarter inch. Um, you can get up to three inch tubing, although most folks are usually somewhere between one inch or three quarter inch and two inch tubing. Um, in this case, there's just a single main line. You'll see vacuum systems with another line above it, a dry line. Uh, and we'll cover that later on in our series, um, but not during this video on a dry line. That's a specific system for uh, using vacuum. So single main line here, um, still could be under vacuum. We have uh, a high tensile wire. So this is high tensile wire. This is what holds the main line up. So the main line's not actually supporting itself, the wire is holding it. And then we have what's called wire ties, which wrap around and connect the high tensile wire to the main line. Going a little bit further down the line, 
we can see a fitting here. And this is just a double male fitting. It's a one inch plastic fitting. Uh, you can actually find these in most any hardware store. Um, you can also get them from Maple Equipment Suppliers. And the double male is barbed and the tubing goes on it. And then in this case, they're using uh, PEX tubing clamps, one inch tubing clamps to hold it. Uh, you can also use hose clamps. Um, but that's, that's the main part of the system. One thing I will say is these plastic mainline fittings, they're much more prone to breaking than a stainless steel fitting. So if you're in it for the long haul and you have the financial ability, I would encourage you to use stainless steel fittings um, over plastic ones because they're gonna last a lot longer and they're gonna hold a lot more tension. These plastic fittings, if there is a large tree that falls on the line, they may pull out. Um, or break where the stainless fittings won't. The other nice thing about the stainless fittings is they're reusable. Um, one problem with the stainless fittings is they cost 10 times or more the cost of a um, plastic fitting. And so that, that's a real thing to think about and there's a lot of folks who use plastic fittings and that's fine. All right, so one of the first things you're gonna do when you're laying out main line, you're of course gonna plan the system. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure it has a slope. You're gonna wanna use some type of level to ensure that slope. Um, but one of the, when you decide which direction you're going to go, you're going to use a high tensile wire and that's going to be one of the first things you do is run that high tensile wire where you want your main line to go. Uh, high tensile wire is really important. It's strong. Uh, it, uh, it's available. You can find it in most farm supply stores and of course maple producer, maple uh, equipment suppliers have it. But it's really important you use high tensile because it's, it's strong and it can take that tension. Don't fall to buying thinner like this is 17 gauge wire in my hand over here uh, this will break it will snap it's not worth having in your system um, you may want to use it for some side ties and things which I'll talk about in a different segment but um, really not something that that you're going to ever use to hold a main line up is anything other than high tensile wire high tensile wire is a little dangerous you can get poked in the eye it can cut you it's pretty strong stuff um, so if you're working with it wear gloves wear eyeglasses, uh, you have to use a spinning jenny. This is a spinning jenny. As I pull it, it releases the wire. It uncoils it. If I have this wire in a bundle and I undo it when it's not in a spinning jenny, it is going to react like a spring and I'm gonna have a, a, a rat's nest that I will never undo. Um, so what you do is you put your wire on the spinning jenny. You do that by bending, bending the ears of this in and then the wire can come off and on. You got four of those, um, you bend them back out, and that's what allows you to, to pull that wire and spin. So really critical tool. This one's on a spike, but in the maple woods, you may actually want one that's a little more elevated. Um, but simple tools for using wire. To cut this, you can use a, a set of dikes. Uh, you can use something like bolt cutters, small bolt cutters, um, usually a, like a pocket knife um, tool isn't strong enough to cut them. Um, I mean, I could cut this with this pocket wire cutter, but it's gonna it's gonna take me a while and do some damage. So, uh, have a have a good strong cutting tool. Um, another useful tool, excuse me, is a fencing tool. So, a fencing tool has wire cutters in it, which can be used to cut the wire. Um, the other nice thing about a fencing tool is you can use it to clamp the wire and bend it. So, these are these are kind of handy tools. Um, from the fencing world that are worthwhile. Keep it in your toolbox. All right, uh, wire ties are, are pretty simple tools. Uh, the wire ties, you buy them in a roll, you just like a roll of a thousand of them. Um, and then you got a twisting tool, which is this. Um, there's other types of twisting tools. This one's probably the simplest, um, but maybe the easiest to use is a twisting tool that pulls down and spins. But I'll, I'll just show you this one. Um, so you got your wire tie. This is again, what's gonna use to connect your high tensile wire to your main line. I'll take my wire tie, I'll, I'll put it across it in the middle. I'll bend it down. I have two loops in that wire tie. I will hook my, my twisting tool through those two loops. Okay, and then I'll put down pressure on it and I'll just twist with my hand until I'm tensioned. Not quite there yet. I don't have to be incredibly tight um, that's pretty good there. I can't move it, but it's also not so tight. If I go too far, I'll break it. So uh, I'll break the wire tie. 
But that's the basics of putting a wire tie on your main line using a twisting tool. There are a few different ways to end your main line, your uh, high tensile wire for your main line. Uh, in this case, the, the sugar maker is using an eye bolt. Uh, so an eye bolt is simple. You just pre pilot drill your tree, uh, then screw your your um, eye bolt in. Leave some space because the tree is going to grow, and you don't want it to swallow that eye bolt. Also recognize this does cause some hazards if you ever send that tree through a sawmill. So just think about which trees you're using and why. And you want to make sure you're going to use a tree that's going to be there for a while. Um, and then what you can do is you can wrap your main line through as the sugar maker did here. And just um, pigtail it a bunch to keep it tight. Another thing you can use is you can use a ferrule. Um, so these... Um, these will bind on the on the wire, so you slide one through one end, and then you would um, slide your bring your wire around your eye bolt or around your tree, depending on how you're doing it. Slide it in on the other, so you got essentially it'll be like this is a mini mini system here. Um, but you would have both wires going through, and then what you can do is you can clamp. You can clamp these down. There's tools specifically for these. I like to use my fencing tool because it works well, but I can clamp that. And this is a double ferrule. It's twice as long as a normal one. So sometimes I'll even clamp those twice, especially if I have a long line with a lot of tension. I may clamp those twice, one on each end. But that will keep this, the friction of that clamp will keep this from spit coming out. So if you're not good at twisting wire like that, you can get some of these um, ferrules and, and use them. You can also double these up. You can put one, you can put another one down the line if you think they're going to slide on you. The other thing you can do is you can take one end of your wire after going through the loose end and just bend it back around. So eye bolts are one way of ending your main line, uh, your high tensile wire for your main line. Another way to do it is to wrap the tree. And this can be done with a couple of pieces of mainline tubing. This is a one inch piece of tubing. I could take a three quarter inch piece of tubing and slide it through there um, to have a double up. But what this does is it acts as a buffer around the tree. So I could take this and I could wrap it around the tree. And for this size tree, I would actually want this to be, this section to be maybe twice as long. But the idea would be that it would go around the back of the tree and it would bend around. And this tubing especially if you had another bigger piece over it, will serve to keep that tree, keep the wire from, from digging into the tree and causing damage. Um, the, the problem with this is that it can slide up and down. So it may slide down during the season if it's not ten tensioned enough. The other problem is if you wrap it around too tight to the tree, so if you just brought it around to like, to like there, then the tree doesn't have room to grow. So if you're gonna wrap this tree you want to actually wrap it out just like you would on a lateral line bring it out two or three feet from the tree the nice thing about it being able to move is you can slide it up and down if you need to adjust your main line um, the other thing is if you're worried about it sliding down you could put a nail behind it so it just sits on top of the nail so I could put a nail under this and then it would just sit on the nail um, so you can wrap your trees and you can actually do it in a way that doesn't damage the tree obviously a nail will have some impact um, but it's up to you and different sugar makers have preference. I, I would expect that most folks who are installing a tubing system may use a combination of both. Um, but a lot of folks do like the eye bolts because they're, they're strong and they're there. So the nice thing about it allowing this to slide is if a tree falls on it, it may just slide down as opposed to breaking something. So just another option that's out there to, uh, to wrap your trees instead of something like an eye bolt. One thing you're going to need to do with your main line uh, high tensile wire is you're going to need to have some way of tensioning it uh, permanently in the woods. And this, this wire here doesn't have a tensioner on this end because the tensioner is on the end towards the sap tank. Um, in some cases on long runs you may put a tensioner on both ends. You may decide just a tensioner on one end. Could be at the end of the line, could be at the beginning. It really doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Um, but you will need some type of tensioner. There's two models that I, that I brought today for the video. One is an inline tensioner, 
the nice thing about this inline tensioner is you don't actually cut your high tensile wire. You just hook it on your, your however you're anchoring it. And then what you do is you um, you put the wire into the, into the slot and then you have a, a spot for a uh, half inch ratchet. And you would then rat take that ratchet and you would tighten this up and it would twist the wire. And I can't do it, this one's already under tension. But it would twist the wire and loop it up in this spool. And then what you would do is, while tension's on it, put this, um, this U-clip through it, which would then prevent it from, from spinning back. Um, these work all right. Uh, not my favorite. They're nice for inline, but um, I think most of the time when you're, people are installing tubing, they're probably going to use some type of ratchet tensioner. And again, these are available at most farm supply stores and obviously maple equipment dealers uh, keep them in stock too. Uh, the biggest thing about these is keep your hands safe because they will pinch your hand, especially when things are under tension. But the way they work is one end connects to your anchor, which if it's an eye bolt can actually just, or, or a hook, can just hook right through. You can hook the bolt right through the, um, right through the end of it. Um, and then the other, the other end, your wire goes through it and you just bend it around. And then what you can do with these is you twist them. You don't do it by hand. You actually do it with a with a tensioning tool, and you twist them, and they reel in the the high tensile wire, um, put it into a spring like state, um, and then they hold the tension. And when you want to release them, you would pull them, and then you have this here, which you can flip back. Again, smart to wear gloves when you're doing this under tension, and then that will allow this to free spool. Don't just let it free spool, always let it down and then let it down some more. Um, but that's how these tensioners work. They work really well. Um, some of them have a, have a square uh, fitting at the end where you can, you can tension them this way. But this, uh, this tool is pretty key. You know, for a eight to $12 tool, you're gonna want it when you want these ratchet tensioners. Um, so these are, these are useful. Uh, you're definitely gonna want them for your high tensile. These are the uh, tensioners uh, for your high tensile wire, and you can just see they're hooked through a, um, a hook bolt and uh, onto your high tensile wire, and uh, that keeps the system tense. And you can use your use your ratchet tool to loosen these or tension these as you need. In this part of the video, I'm going to show you how to uh, connect the uh, terminus of a main line, either uh, in this case the end in the woods, or this could be the same for the end uh, near the sap tank with the exception of this end plugged, whereas the end near the sap tank will be open or connected to a vacuum system. Um, in this case we have a plug here, it's just a fitting, plug fitting, clamped on to keep everything sealed up. Um, our wire ties are serving to hold tension on this main line, so the main line is not going to slide here because these wire ties, there's enough of them and they're tight enough that they're going to prevent that from happening. Uh, another way you can you can keep your main line tight is you can use um, one of these these clasps that uh, will serve to hold that main line and won't pull off. Mostly though, these are nice for installation. They're there's a little, they're a little costly, but the way they work is they just slide on the tubing. And if you slide them nice and gentle, they slide. If you pull them on the end, they don't slide at all. And what these can work for you is to connect to the end of your tubing and pull tension on it while you're installing all your wire ties. So I can put this on my tubing, I can put a ratchet system, a come along, something like that on it, uh, tighten it right up, get my tubing right tight with my, um, with my high tensile wire, and then I can go down the line and put in all my wire ties. You see these are every like six inches or so? That's because this is the end. We don't want it sliding. Once you get into the middle of the line, you can do a wire tie every foot or 18 inches. Uh, you don't want to go much more than that in terms of wire tie spacing because then you're going to have dips in your main line, which are going to end up being freeze up portions and blockages during the maple season. So every 12 to 18 inches is adequate, um, but at the end you'll do a few more just for a little bit more tension. Um, that's how you'd end your main line. So when you're running it, you got your high tensile wire up tight, then you run your main line, pull your main line tight hold it tight, 
um, and then connect your wire ties from there. Okay, um, what I'm going to show you now is how you might install a fitting on a main line. So maybe where you need to connect the end of one main line to another, or you need to do a repair. Um, this is the way to do it. Or you need to put a Y in uh, so you could T off or Y off another main line coming in. Uh, there's a couple of ways of doing this. One is using uh, this main line uh, connecting tool. Really, really nice tool. Um, it's got this, this model of it. Again, two vice grips. Um, welded to a to a system that has a, a screw in it which can pull it closer or or widen it I'll try to do that slow so it can be seen on video um, and then it has a clamp for um, one inch tubing on this model and a clamp for three quarter inch tubing on this model uh, this main line here is three quarter inch tubing so if I were trying to install a new fitting on here what I would do is I would clamp one side, clamp the other side, make sure they're clamped very, very solid. Um, in this case, I am clamping over the high tensile only because I don't want to cut these wire ties because um, I'm not actually going to take this apart. But if I were taking this apart, I would take these wire ties off and I would clamp under the high tensile. Um, and then what I could do is if I needed to cut this, if I was putting in a, a, a T or a Y, I could clamp these down, I could um, turn it in so I'm putting tension, pulling these together, and then as long as these are strong enough, as long as I clamp them down tight enough using my vice grips, I can cut this main line and it's not going to go, it's not going to go crazy. Um, and then what I can do is I can, I can widen the main line out going the opposite direction, put my fitting in, and then crank it back together, pushing the main line into the fitting to where I want it to be. Um, so this is a very useful tool. They cost a couple hundred bucks, um, but if you're installing main line, you're probably gonna want one of these, it's worth the investment. Another way, because they do two things, they hold the main line, they press it while pressing it together, and um, they also hold the main line from, from separating on itself. So it's a really nice tool for that dual purpose. Now, if you have another way of holding the main line together, or you want to install a fitting, perhaps you want to install a valve at the end of your main line, another way to do that is you can use a propane torch. And what you do with the torch, and propane's the way to go, not map gas or something like that, which is going to get too hot. You can very carefully warm up, I'll do this, warm up the end of your main line. You're not melting it. You're just warming it so it becomes more flexible. And once it's more flexible, then if you have your fitting, you can press the fitting in and this will cool around the fitting and tighten itself to the fitting. Um, whether you're using a torch and pressing, pressing the fitting in or you're using your, your, um, rat, your, your uh, plier tool to put the fitting on, you're still gonna need some type of uh, hose clamp or, um, or pipe clamp to hold that fitting on if it's a plastic fitting a, st a steel fitting will actually hold itself stainless steel but you still probably are going to put some clamps on it just for uh, safe measures so if you're putting fittings together make sure you put your clamps on first over your over your line because um, once you get that fitting on your main line you're not going to take it off uh, so that's that's a couple of methods for putting fittings on the main line here's an example of a fitting uh, it's the T fitting along the main line where you're branching off another main line. One thing that's really important with these fittings is that you don't have tension on it because these plastic fittings especially will break. So when you're planning out your system, make sure you think about whether you need a T here or a Y here, depending on which, side, which way your branch is coming off your main line. So that way there's no tension on that system. The height of your main line is an important thing to consider. Um, it's obviously going to play a role with the slope and the topography to make sure you're pitched enough to drain the sap. But it also makes a big difference when you think about snow load. Uh, this main line is about knee height, which is probably the minimum I want. There may be exceptions where you just need to have it lower because of how the landscape is and how you need to run your, run your pitch. Um, but much lower than this, and I might fear this being covered with snow during the maple season. 
And if the sap is running, if it's let's say 40 degrees above the snow, but freezing in the snow and my main line is buried in the snow, um, I'm actually not gonna have that main line thaw out. And I could have situations where the snow is weighing it down, causing a dip and causing a freeze and a blockage of my sap flow. So ideally your main line is gonna be set at a height that's above the snow, but still low enough to allow you to get enough pitch on your lateral lines. Because if you run your main line too high, and then you have to run a lateral line off of it, you're going to have a problem getting pitch on that lateral line, and eventually you're going to need a ladder to tap your last tree. So think about the height of your main line, and I think somewhere between knee height and, um, and sort of belly height for, for most average folks is a good way to go for your main line height. Obviously working with the pitch of the land and exceptions where you need them to be. All right, uh, if you're running a main line, one thing you're going to need to think about is supports along that main line to keep it from sagging because it's going to want gravity is going to want to win. So you're going to need to have different ways of supporting it. Um, oftentimes, I, I call these side ties. People call them different things. Um, in this case, uh, the sugar maker is using a eye bolt to uh, act as a midline support, and that eye bolt's just in the tree. It's a very simple thing. Holds the high tensile wire, and then the main line is able to stay up and stay at the right pitch. Again, this is all being leveled as you're putting it up. So the location of this eye bolt needs to be really uh, thought through as it relates to the eye bolt after it and the eye bolt before it to make sure you have the correct pitch. Um, so this is one method of doing it. There are other methods of doing it. One way is you loop a piece of wire around your high tensile wire, wrap it around the tree with enough um, with enough uh, slack that it's not going to girdle the tree just like you would with the end of a um, end of a lateral line you're doing it with a wire and what when it's going around the tree it's going through a piece of main line or two so that way it doesn't dig and grow into the tree or the tree doesn't grow into the wire um, that's one that's another way of doing it wrapping the tree and those can slide up and down um, and they may need a little bit more maintenance than something like this eye bolt but if a limb falls on them, they'll be able to slide where this eye bolt won't, um, although high tensile wire is very strong. The other way of, of doing this would be to have some sort of post. And this could be a wood post, or this could be a piece of rebar uh, that's pressed into the ground and then connected to your actual uh, high tensile wire. Some people really like to use posts because instead of having this zigzag situation for their midline supports, you know, where they have to zag to a tree and zig to another one, um, they can actually do more of a straight shot and use posts. Um, and so rebar is nice because it's flexible. Um, wood posts are nice because they're not flexible. And so you got to decide what you'd like. Wood posts are more likely to break. Uh, rebar is more likely to bend. Uh, and so a lot of sugar makers stick to trees because they don't have to deal with that. Uh, posts are harder to put in the ground. Rebar you can, you can hammer in pretty quick. So there's a lot of ways of doing this, um, and again, you may want to use some combination if you're installing a tubing system in your woods. Especially think about posts if you don't have enough trees to capture for a portion of your main line. Here's an example of a post being used to level a main line. Like I said, there's multiple things that the producer may want to use in the woods. Uh, this is working pretty well. It's just a T-post. It's got clips on it which can be used to hold and adjust this main line depending on where you want it. So um, a pretty useful system uh, to have in the woods. Just to wrap up the, uh, the whole main line system here, you see the two main lines coming into a T, and then that is coming down into a spout, which would go into the sugar maker sap tank. This is a gravity system, so it's just going to drain down into the sap tank. Um, if it were a vacuum system, this would have to go into the whole uh, release or vacuum system setup. Uh, but yeah, this is the terminus of the mainline system into the sap tank. One of the best times to start doing some maintenance on your tubing system is in the fall. Uh, the leaves are usually gone by then, you can see things really well. Uh, you can start walking your main lines, looking up your lateral lines, checking for branches that are down. Um, you're gonna have situations where branches fell on lateral lines. It's worth picking those up moving them in the fall before you want to move them before the snow falls because if those branches get iced into the ground you're gonna have a lot of problem getting them up so go through the fall um, check for downed branches get your lateral lines up pitch to where you want them 
and um, and do that maintenance. You'll have to go through again during the season when you tap, of course, and you can do, do maintenance then, but it saves you a lot of time, uh, especially if you're pressed for time on tapping. You're much better off do, getting your tubing systems all up to speed in the fall, and then when you go through tapping, there'll be a lot less repairs to make. So take advantage of that time before the maple season to get out in your woods and keep your systems up and running. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I hope this video series was informative for you. We would welcome feedback on it at the Yale Forests. Um, I also want to give another thanks to the ACER Access and Development Program for supporting this educational campaign that we're, we're putting on through the Yale Forests. Uh, I also want to thank Rob Lamoth for letting us come out and uh, film some of his, his one of his least, least sugar bushes here in Burlington, Connecticut. So please reach out if you have any questions. Uh, we'd love to chat, and I hope you'll stay engaged with Yale as we offer these uh, maple, oppor maple educational opportunities over the next few years.